Hey everybody, I am Josh Levine and welcome to another episode of Private Market Insights. This is our conversation series where we discuss important topics related to the small business M&A industry. Please subscribe to our show through YouTube or anywhere you get your podcasts. We are a little bit outside of our usual cadence this week, so please stay tuned for our next episode, which will be next week rather than two weeks from now. Also, a quick update on our work with Private Market Labs. We've been doing a lot of behind the scenes work on enhancing data quality over the last couple of weeks and should have some fun results to share very, very soon. So this week's podcast kicks off a two episode series about international M&A, which is a topic that has been much requested from our community. And I have a fantastic guest with me here today to talk about it. I am so happy to welcome Tristan Maher to the podcast. Tristan has had a fascinating career in M&A, working in places as far flung as Singapore and Latin America. He is an expert in international SMB acquisitions, and we are so fortunate to have him here on the pod. Welcome, Tristan. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Josh. Happy to be here. Fantastic. So um, I, uh, for those of you who have been listening to this podcast for a little while, you know that I don't typically do introductions or bio rundowns. We usually just jump right into the questions. In this case, I think it's appropriate to actually just get a sense of the places you've worked and done deals, your focus within the M&A industry and what you're working on right now. I think that'll be helpful context for the audience. Sure. Sounds good. So I started my M&A career covering middle market healthcare services companies at Houlihan Loki based in Texas. Uh, this was all private markets, mostly advising entrepreneurs selling to private equity funds and a few deals advising a PE fund doing a buy side deal. Then I worked at Gordon Dial in New York, where I got was doing all large cap M&A. This was mostly industry agnostic and was great for getting the public market lens. <clears throat> And the abridged version of my next transition of getting over to Singapore was that when I was a kid, I lived in India for a bit. During undergrad, I studied abroad in Singapore. And after living in New York with, you know, at the tail end of COVID and with everything being shut down, the plan I put together after leaving Singapore wasn't as feasible. And Thailand was the only country that was open. So being a little bit burned out and just really ready to get to Asia, I moved to Thailand without much of a plan. I knew that I was resourceful and could absorb some risk early in my career. So I moved with the plan of I'll figure it out. And it's pretty much what happened. I, after being there for a few months, someone in my network in Singapore introduced me to some clients there. I started working with a boutique based in Singapore. And now I am based in Latin America. I have a few individual clients I'm advising. I'm working with a partner in the US where we have a few deals in market right now where we're looking to place them with buyers as well as I'm doing a little bit of M&A education with guys here in Latin America, as well as in the Middle East and the UAE, where I'm helping them prepare companies to be sold, as well as helping them put together a strategy to grow their baby through inorganic growth. Uh, I will be launching a course doing M&A education in the coming weeks, which will have the goal of taking someone from a pure operator and making it more dangerous at the negotiating table. Given throughout my career, there's been a stark contrast between the guy who's done a few years at, at a bank, done a few years at a private equity firm, and then maybe got an MBA, and the individual who has been in industry for his entire career. So I'm looking to bridge that gap a little bit. Fantastic. Yeah, the education piece is really interesting. Do you find, like, what are some of the things, like the blind spots that you see in international communities where this process is not quite as popular or well known versus the United States where we have, you know, SMB, Twitter, which is a huge thing. We have search funder, we have all these great business school education courses and, and things like that. Like where do you see the the gaps? I'd say it's just a little bit more of an operator mindset where you find a lot of these guys in the US, I think it's just in the US where you do have the deepest capital markets in the world, you might have a little bit more of a financier's mindset where a pure entrepreneur, they it, it's a good thing that they have the dream of on oh, building a community, I'm building a company, where at the end of the day, from our lens, hey, look, at the end of the day, when you're building a company, all you're doing is you're building a financial asset, which is a stream of cash flows, and you need to make it higher growing, you need to make it more stable, more robust, uh, less risky, et cetera, to maximize that shareholder value. So I wouldn't necessarily say it's a massive international versus American thing. 
as a entrepreneur versus a financier deal guy type of differentiation. And it's just the rest of the world that has a less financialized economy. Interesting. That's, that's fascinating. And it sort of speaks to, I think, in part sort of the way that SMB M&A is taught at a lot of the business schools as part of often like a private equity style course, or, you know, I, I think with that a lot of the people, the pioneers in this space are coming from private equity backgrounds are sort of teaching the, the art of deal making and it, as a, as a key piece of this versus kind of the entrepreneur, I'm going to build and run this thing. And that's, that's super interesting. Exactly. So, um, yeah, I, I'd love to dive in a little bit on, first of all, SMB m and in, uh, in Asia, <clears throat> excuse me. So how are some of these transactions similar and different to transactions in the United States? Um, what would an American investor need to know to close a transaction, uh, in Asia specifically? Sounds good. Uh, I think there's a few points to cover here first. I think first and, and probably most important one is it's hard to say doing deals in Asia is like X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. uh, Asia is certainly a big place, a lot of countries, a lot of different legal frameworks to navigate through. So um, buying a company in Singapore is going to be very different from Thailand or Indonesia, where a lot of countries in Asia, they're going to have more strict foreign ownership laws where, for example, Thailand and Indonesia, the companies have to be 51% locally owned. Hmm. So as an American, you're not going to go there and, okay, you're going to do your standard mini LBO. Um, there are tools that people use, whether it's, oh, you give 26% of a company to the partner that you met and then 25% to your housekeeper and, and hope that they don't know each other. Um, or a lot of guys will, all right, they'll put it in their wife's name or hopefully not the girlfriend's name, but it does happen. And I do not recommend. Um, <laughs> and, Sounds like you've spoken from uh, the experience of a deal that fell apart, possibly. No, no, no. Luckily not. Just you hear a lot of horror stories. Mm. And um, so my, my advice would be, look, if, if you have no ties to Asia and you want to get exposure to the region, you want to consider buying a company in the region, get boots on the ground and do a lot of diligence, not necessarily on an individual com company but get to know lawyers, get to know the local business community, get to know other expats and investors who have gone into whatever country you're looking at and have been successful. Talk to people who haven't been successful, understand what went wrong. Um, that's one key point I'll come back to is understand what can go wrong, how it can go wrong and how you can protect yourself. Um, and just don't, don't be a tourist. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean, hey, look, you need to live there for 20 years and try to get uh, nationalization and, and you know, have a family there. Um, you know, I'd say, you know, six, 12 months minimum boost on the ground before making any investments would be pretty smart. So the next point I'll make is I don't want to get too theoretical. However, this is a good mental model I would use a lot in Thailand is capital is expensive, but labor is cheap. Mm -hmm. So an example of that would be it's very cheap to go get your teeth cleaned or, or to go get Botox or something like that, where it's just a nurse and uh, helping you. But it's very expensive to go get an MRI scan where you have to use a big expensive piece of machinery. So I can dig into each piece a little bit more where, okay, yeah. labor is cheap. That makes sense. Where capital is expensive. This is a little bit more of a hypothesis, but I'll, I'll dig into the ex capital being more expensive part and tie it back to the foreign ownership piece. So what makes up a company can essentially be broken down into labor, capital, and IP. IP, you can have domiciled anywhere. You know, you have your, your entity in the British Virgin Islands that owns all the IP. And so oh, all the profit goes to the British Virgin Islands, funny enough. Um, but capital and labor are going to be pretty geographically tied, usually. So that's what makes up a company where what makes up the cash flows is going to be essentially two components. The operations year to year and then the terminal value um can i trust that the audience has a decent understanding of like a dcf and what that means or should i explain that yeah I, I i think we'll we'll be okay if uh if okay. you need a, a little bit of a refresher there's there's great resources online this is to the audience great resources online to to review some of these concepts but yeah let's let's dig in on it okay great so Let's say you make an investment into a company or an asset or whatever, and you know that the terminal value of that is going to be highly discounted. It's going to be damaged. It's going to be a little bit harder to sell down the line, given, oh, 
I only own 49%. The other capital structure might be a little bit messy. It's, it's uh, this partner, that partner. You need to, if you're an investor, any investor has some return that they're aiming for. There, a larger proportion of that needs to be coming from yearly cash flows as opposed to building a business to be sold. Hmm. So that's like the basic mental model. Okay, capital is going to be expensive. Um, if you're looking at buying a company or, or starting a company, the return on equity on a year to year basis is going to be quite high. But when you go to exit, it's going to be a little bit harder um, to exit that and get a, a real premium exit as opposed in Hong Kong or Singapore in the US. Uh, and then finally, Asia, I would say it's becoming much more Asiatic. Prag Khanna is a, is a writer based in Singapore where he writes about this, how the world is becoming much more polar. The Americas are trading with each other more. Uh, Europe, the Middle East and Northern Africa, they're trading with each other more and Asia is trading with each other more. Um, so this has also been accelerated by macro events more recently in the past few years where the U.S. and a lot of Western countries are getting a bit more litigious and, um, you know, passing sanctions in certain countries. And they're not that effective. Or essentially, like, this is Adam Smith 101 economic level stuff where, hey, look, if there are consumers demanding goods, people are going to figure out how to get them those goods. So what's essentially happening is supply chains are getting more links and goods might be going to from one country to another to another before it's getting to its final end user um where yeah pe people want their goods whatever law written in, in another country says that you're not allowed to trade it it's it's gonna get there one way or another uh where there's a chinese saying the mountains are high and the emperor is far away which rings very true here so um yeah to sum up compared to the us it's where capital markets are the deepest in the world. It's much more important to be an absolute expert in your industry, to have strong, trustworthy lawyers to help you navigate the markets. Um, if you're gonna be involved with a business that has internationalized operations, as opposed to, okay, you're gonna set up a company in Malaysia, you're gonna service Malaysians with Malaysian employees and Malaysian goods. If you're gonna be cross-border, there could be a lot of synergies you can have there. And um, don't be a tourist investor. Know your industry, be an expert, talk to other experts, leverage other people's expertise. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's so fascinating. And I wonder, I, I just have a million follow-up questions, a number of directions we could go. So let's, let's start with this. I think you mentioned something that's really interesting, which is that as the world becomes more polar and, and a lot of regional trade is picking up, have you seen that? in a level of like comfort transacting with non-regional buyers. So for example, do you feel like an American buyer would be disadvantaged trying to buy a company in Singapore now versus five years ago or 10 years ago? <clears throat> yes, but not because of the reason you said. So okay. I, I think, I mean, especially coming out of COVID, I think Singapore in particular has gotten a little bit more insular. Um, and I think there are just less Americans as there are now. I mean, I, when I was in Singapore, it was actually five years ago. And I remember during COVID seeing on LinkedIn every once in a while, so-and-so who I either, uh, I knew them from when I lived in India as a kid. And it's like, oh, after 30 years in the region, we're going home. Or someone I met when I was in Singapore after you know 10, 20 years, whatever, we're, we're going back to the US or the UK or wherever. Um, I don't think that's a, an American thing, though. I think it's just a little bit more insular, and they just happen not to be there. But I don't want to say it's harder. Hmm. If, if you have a, a bad passport, then yeah, it'll be a little bit harder. Sure. But uh, yeah, regarding being an American, operating in Singapore or wherever else, it's um, I wouldn't say you have any undue difficulties as opposed to a Loatian doing business in Singapore. Gotcha. And so do you think, staying on the topic of Singapore, you mentioned that there's a, a lot of country by country differences, which makes perfect sense. We can't just, Asia's not monolithic, America's aren't monolithic, South America's you know not monolithic, yes. right? Does Singapore have the same kind of restrictions on ownership as Thailand, for example? Singapore does not. Singapore is in, in it's constantly the number one or number two freest market in the world. Um, there's a reason why, you know, Ray Dalio is opening his family office there. They have a new scheme to bring family office 
family office money there. Um, very, very welcome to foreign investment. Fantastic. And then um, you you use the phrase a couple of times, like, don't be a tourist investor, right? In your mind, like, what does a tourist investor look like? And what is an example of, and, and sort of how would a, like a non-tourist investor look? I mean, so like, can you kind of compare and contrast those two things? Yes, a hundred percent. So um, specifically like being in Thailand, whether it was like from a networking group I'm in or at the Muay Thai gym I would train at or whatever, it was very not uncommon. I would meet someone who said, oh yeah, I'm here for a month or two. I'm looking at buying some property to do some Airbnbs. And they would have no clue that in Thailand, a foreigner can only own a piece of land for 30 years at a time. It's essentially a locked in long-term lease. Um, and some people would end up buying properties and then leasing them out. I, I know a lot of people who've done that, um, non-tourist investors as well as you know longer term uh, you know, expats or, or longer term tourists, whatever the, the best phrase is for them. But that would be like the pinnacle. Hey, I'm here. I want to pick up a few properties and Airbnb them out where it's okay. You don't speak the language. You've spoken to one, maybe two lawyers. Uh, you're talking to the guy you met at the gym about this. <laughs> um, where that is the pinnacle tourist investor, where I've also met a lot of people. My old next door neighbor, it was a, an American guy and a Russian woman. She was a, a lawyer. He was a, he ran call centers and uh, lead generation facilities throughout uh, the Philippines and Thailand. They'd each been there for over 10 years. Um, their kids went to school there. They were part of the British club. Um, they, you know, they're not going to become Thai citizens, but they've certainly integrated and uh, they not tourists. Gotcha. Yeah, they've made that, it home as much as they're getting. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, so let's let's move to Latin America. I know that you've spent a little less time in Latin than you have in Asia. So this is kind of maybe some of your early observations. Um, how are these transactions sort of similar and different to what you've seen in the U.S. and what you've seen in Asia? And you know anything unique or different that a U.S. investor would need to know to close a deal in Colombia, for example, versus closing a deal elsewhere? Sure. Sounds good. So. Um, I'll highlight, I've been here for a little over a month, uh, in Colombia specifically, and then I'll be moving to Argentina Saturday. So very soon. And I plan on, <laughs> that'll be home base for me for a year or two, maybe three years. Um, however, I'll, I'll use some principles, which I've learned thus far, as well as something I have seen over the past month. So the big one is again, don't be a tourist. Don't, if you know, you live in Florida, you live in New York, you're Texas, wherever, I'm going to go to Columbia for two weeks and pick up a few properties and Airbnb them out. Definitely not a good idea. Um, I think ownership laws as well as um, integration is a lot more friendly in the new world in general. Um, you, you can move to most of the new world. Learn Spanish and Portuguese are much easier to learn for English speakers than Thai or Mandarin. Um, and so it'll be much easier to integrate. I think one, it's also a little bit closer. Um, and there's still no shortage of horror stories where, Hey, look, you, you set up a business and you don't do your full due diligence and then something goes wrong that you don't know about, or you enter the wrong business or just straight up extortion or theft or something. Um, it happens. Um, yeah, that's the big thing. Become integrated. I'd say like six to 12 months minimum in a country before you start looking for a specific business to buy. That's just country integration, let alone, okay, now you're looking at deals and, and doing diligence on a specific company. Um, you want to speak the language, especially in Latin America, where it is easier to learn. Um, you know, in three months, you should be able to be conversational in Spanish or Portuguese. Uh, speak to a lot of lawyers, speak to locals, speak to other expats who've set up businesses and been successful, and really understand the landscape. So I read it between the lines a little bit here, but it sounds like one of the challenges is for people who are not well integrated into the culture, into the community, who don't speak the language, it can, it sounds like it can be sort of much easier to take advantage of a person like that, both in terms of the, the quality of the assets that they're purchasing, the, the counterparties, the, the deal structures, that kind of stuff. 
And is that sort of why you're emphasizing the the legal support element? Are there other sort of risks associated with being a, a, a tourist uh, investor, let's say, um, beyond sort of like getting getting your lunch eaten? Yeah, I'll, I'll share a shorter story here where I have a, um, a second cousin, an extended cousin, ex extended family member who he opened a pizza shop in Mexico. So um, not sure exactly what happened, but given you know some stories I've, I've heard in, in across Asia and South America, it's okay. Maybe you you know there's some certain tax like things that you need to pay in a in uh, to be a part of a community that you know maybe he wasn't able to afford that you know put that into the budget um, or it, it, at the end of the day it's, it's a very similar thing to just paying a tax that you need to do your diligence on and understand okay am I stepping on someone's turf am I um, am I going to be accepted is this business wanted here because at the end of the day if we're talking about international M and A we're speaking to an audience who is going to be a foreigner and ultimately look it's it's important to be a good foreigner there are good foreigners and there are bad foreigners you want to add value not be extractionary um we're certainly you know you're not going to be doing 1980s style safeway lbo deals where okay i'll come in chop half the workforce and you aren't really adding value and whatnot you need to be you know thinking um there's certainly a lot of people come in you know cambodia is a country that's very well known for hey look you can go sh set up a bakery or a pastry shop and do very, very well. Um, a, lot of, a lot of French moved to Cambodia, partly due to the, uh, the colonial history there, a little friendly, sim similar enough cuisine. Um, but yeah, it's, it's another thing, add value, don't be extractionary and um, understand you're a foreigner. Yeah, makes sense. So um, in terms of deal structuring itself, right? One of the big differences that we hear all the time that I hear all the time as I talk to people who are interested in buying a small business is this, the SBA 7A program in the United States is a, is a huge advantage for, for doing business and buying companies here, um, lower cost of capital than a commercial loan. Um, you know, what does access to debt and capital look like for, you know, non SBA, non-American transactions? You know, what is it? Is it is capital still relatively easy to find? You know, like you said, um, customers find a way, or you know, are there barriers that people need to be expecting if they're thinking about an international transaction? So, uh, I mean, so I'll come back. Countries are different. However, um, some countries are going to be much much harder than the U.S. So mm -hmm. the U.S. is typically going to be the, some of the easiest in the world, not the easiest. We know that deepest capital markets. On the equity equity side, it's going to be very similar. You know, money you've saved up. You know, okay, a, um, a partner, a family member, a friend who's willing to go in and deal with you. For debt, it's going to be a little bit trickier. There's going to be less government sponsored programs, especially for foreigners buying businesses. There's also going to be a lot more mes funds that'll come in and mm. give you mes debt, whether it's convertible or another solution. And almost in any other country outside the U.S., it's going to be it's very country specific for what options exist, but it's going to be a much lower percentage of debt. You're, you're going to want another, another, a little bit more cushion, more equity cushion. Um, Cause part of the reason, you know, if someone is listening to this and they want to do international M and A, they have a bit more risk tolerance. They understand that, Hey, if I invest in Georgia in 2018, if now that we're looking back in 2024, we know that, Hey, you did very, very well. Um, so that risks come with some reward, which someone interested, interested in this topic is willing to absorb. Um, and that type of risk is going to be less financialized then. It's going to be a more operational type of risk. So you don't want to have that financialized risk. Um, and then one thing for deal structuring, specifically in, in countries where you do have weird or you do have some foreign ownership restrictions, some type of convertible debt will... Uh, help you own all the company essentially or have more control of the company than you would be able to otherwise if you invest as the foreigner and okay i have my 49 percent equity so it gets 51 percent equity but then oh i'm also funding the deal with some a convertible debt product and then it converts and then oh now i own 100 percent of the company or now i own much more of the company um there, there's a lot of financial products that exist to especially structure the cash flows such that hey uh you're the one operating you're, you're really at the helm and if it's a, just name on a piece of paper 
um, they're not going to be taking more than half of your profits. Gotcha. Um, what about for, for due diligence? Um, so how does diligence differ when evaluating deals outside of North America? You already touched on one piece of this, which is the, the tax piece. And so we'd be definitely interested in that part of it. Um, you mentioned when we were chatting before that there are, you know, accounting and financial challenges just in terms of how things are reported in terms of how things are taxed that can make things more complicated. Um, let's, let's dig in on that piece a little bit. Sure. So diligence in general will be typically a little bit more sticky. Um, as in, in, as you're going more down market in general, okay, the books are going to be a little less clean. You probably have to go back and, you know, not get creative with ad backs, but more appropriately bucket some things. Um, it would just be a little bit more less sophisticated in general. The biggest thing I'd recommend is just, Hey, look, especially if you're merging multiple companies, finish them, don't have, you know, okay, I've stuck three companies together. Two of them are in accrual accounting still. One is cash accounting, and now I need to go raise more equity to buy another company. Um, finish the acquisitions. Make sure everything is spick and spam once it's under your ownership and once you've actually merged them together. Finish the integration process because um, that will make things a lot easier to raise more equity or more debt to make further acquisitions. If it's, hey, look, I'm not just sticking things together. I'm professionalizing them. Once they come under my umbrella, things look like they're coming out of a out of a first world country, out of country with deep capital markets and they've been professionalized. And that'll, that'll also be where you can get some multiple uplift as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so at this point in the podcast, we are gonna open things up to our audience for questions. So if you have questions for Tristan, please put them in the chat. And, um, you know, I have certainly a few more questions uh, that I've written down that I'm excited to ask. So as I do that, please put your put your questions in the chat and um, we will have uh, we'll have Tristan answer them. So um, I guess first sort of additional question, um, any stories that our audience would find interesting? I think obviously we've been speaking very theoretically so far, but, um, you know, maybe uh, illustrative stories that you could share with the audience. Sure. I, I have a good story. So um, it covers a lot, a lot of the principles I spoke about. So it's very common in, in Asia. Guys will move there and they'll want to start a company to give themselves a visa. And where motorcycles are much more common, they'll say, oh, I'll buy, you know, three or four motorcycles and oh, I can justify getting the Ducati and the cruiser and this and that. So they'll get a few motorcycles, they'll rent them out. Uh, it's a pretty crowded market. And, you know, I ride bikes, but I also like jet skis. So I was looking at the market and I realized, okay, on the, on the east side of the island, there's a bunch of yacht clubs. You can do like daily jet ski rentals, you know, island hopping for a few hundred bucks a day. And essentially I put together a plan where I buy a jet ski and my all, my whole marketing plan was just reach out to the yacht rental companies where they'll rent a yacht for, you know, three, five, $8,000 a day and just tack it on for, you know, three to 500 bucks. And then you'll get it for the full six hours as opposed to most yacht trips. You'll get it for 30 minutes to 60 minutes. So I did the research. I found a seller of a jet ski. I had a manager who would, was already reaching out to the yacht rental companies to build those relationships. So doing the marketing, I had a place to store it. Uh, I had everything ready to go. I just needed to make it legal, get the corporate st structure ball rolling, and then I would buy the jet ski. So a little bit more information is, so that's the east side of the island, not really pretty beaches and whatnot, more yacht clubs. The west side of the island is where all the tourists are, it's the very pretty picturesque beaches. So they have jet ski rentals where it's like, all right, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, like very short term, just right on the beach. And I understood that, hey, look, there are certain businesses you can't mess with. You can't be a competitor. Um, it's, you just don't mess with them. So at this stage, all right, I was speaking to my lawyer and I explained how I have everything set up. And what she told me was, Tristan, okay, I, I can set, up, set this up for you. However, if you do this, you're literally gonna be killed. And <laughs> what she explained is, look, it, it, it's a mafia ran business. It doesn't matter that, oh, I'm doing daily rentals on a different part of the island to a different market. Um, it, the optics were just such that, hey, look, you're a foreigner. Do not mess with mafia businesses. 
even businesses that are completely above board, jet ski rentals, sometimes they're mafia ran. And that's also partly why the numbers look so good on my end, where, okay, rent, buy a jet ski for like 10 grand um, for the high season. Okay, it'll pay, f- the jet ski will pay for itself in three or four months, and then everything else is profit while also creating a few jobs for locals. Um, and, you know, I thought it was a pretty good venture. And because I was able to speak to a lawyer who came very high, highly recommended, uh, they're a Westerner. She, they had been there for like 20 years, which, and she knew the local landscape and she was able to appro- appropriately guide me in the right direction and uh, help me avoid some mistakes where you really never know, hey, what can go wrong? Even if everything on paper looks good, there might be something that you're just not privy to. And it's really important to have that, you know, that 20 year experience to borrow from. That's wild. That's, and this is the first private market insights death threat that we've heard. <laughs> so, but it's more of a warning. It's the, the <laughs> most mortal danger we've seen any of our guests in at any point. Um, that's a that's a wild story. So, it sounds like really the the relationship with the lawyer, I mean, was so crucial here. How do you, how do you personally, when you're looking for representation and you're looking for people, you touched on this a little bit, is it, you know, are you looking for Westerners with experience? Are there any other pieces that you're, you're looking for, uh, when you're trying to figure out what is, how do I build my circle? How do I find the people that I, I want to trust? Um, if not a Westerner, someone who certainly understands Westerners, um, you know, may, maybe someone who's from the country, but went to university in the US or Canada or the UK or wherever, um, who understand your business, where particularly I'm American. So I'm not sure if you understand, know about this, but Americans, we have our weird tax laws, we're we're taxed wherever we are in the world, we have to record our income. Um, We're in Thailand, actually, funny enough, we are allowed to own 100% of a business. There's like a specific treaty that only Americans are allowed to own 100% of a company, but it has to be in certain industries. It's pretty expensive to set up, but you can. So actually, Thailand would be a place where an American can go buy 100% of a business. All the other principles still stand. Don't be a tourist. Um, But hang out at the right places. Get get to know people that you genuinely enjoy, right? I like golfing. I like training MMA. So, okay, I've hung golfed with some guys met people at Muay Thai gyms in Thailand, that's very popular. And then here doing the same thing, be, be outgoing, be friendly. And um, cause as well, Hey, I'm a foreigner in Colombia. I'll be a foreigner in Argentina. If I meet someone from the U S um, who I have nothing in common with, if we met at a bar in Dallas, we wouldn't really have much to talk about, but Hey, you're here. We have something in common. It's, it's a good, starting point and yeah. um yeah yeah that's that's fascinating um again questions for for tristan put them in the chat um next question on my end um this is i i think my the last one that i have planned certainly is a you clearly have a, a very unique perspective on on the smb a market what do you see coming down the pipeline over the next six to 12 months you know how do your and, and do your outlooks differ uh, when it comes to different parts of the world. Sure. So I'll talk about uh, in the U.S. I've, I've gotten a little bit more U.S. exposure more recently, and I've been talking to a lot of people who are trying to get into the business. And I think a lot of people are coming into the business with the uh, it's the silver wave. It's, it's pretty easy to buy boomers businesses at this stage. However, especially micro cap m and it's becoming more common. There's a lot of people teaching it. There's a lot of people talking about it on Twitter and X. Business schools are teaching it. The search fund model is pretty tried and true at this point where people will do their uh, two years of banking, two years of private equity, two years of MBA. And then instead of going back to private equity, they'll try to get money from a family member or an alumnus and go out and buy their own company. Yes, there is a lot of people retiring from boring main street businesses, which are stable and cash flowing that you can buy. However, it is very competitive on the buyer side as well. There's a lot of buyers competing, competing for those businesses. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's, um, and we can see it. There are so many, you know, both 
like hard metrics and even soft metrics, like, you know, conference attendance and, you know, courses being added at different MBA programs and yes. you know, the size of the communities online, right? We talk about, you know, what are the leading indicators to, you know, metrics around how many acquisitions are being done, right? You see consistency in terms of acquisitions being done, even with rough capital markets and COVID and things like that. So, I mean, really the interest has been so, so massive and, you know, this is why I think one of the reasons why I start to hear people ask me, Hey, Josh, you know, are you, you know, you're going to bring international listings onto private market labs, or you're going to start, you know, working in that area, because I think people see the competition and yep. they, they say, Hey, how do I, how do I find the next thing? What is the, the less competitive, you know, first in the door kind of, a um, thought process. And so, um, you know, uh, any, any parting thoughts for, for the person thinking like that? Cause I can think of three or four people just off the top of my head that I've talked to about this. Yeah. I'd say the, the biggest thing is still know your edge, know what you're bringing to the marketplace. Cause at the end of the day, someone can, it's still a buyer build decision. And if you spent your entire career in marketing, you know, marketing, it doesn't really make sense for you to buy a foreign exchange, um, business. It doesn't make sense for you to get into crypto to cash exchanges, uh, where I had someone who was moving to Thailand and said, Oh, I want to start this. And I explained to him the, the stuff I've talked about, Hey, you need to do your due diligence, speak to people in the business, blah, blah, blah. But also what edge do you have in this business? It doesn't yeah. make sense for you to start something from scratch or learn from something from scratch. Cause at the end of the day, a lot of, especially in the SMB space, you're buying this to run and be the CEO yourself. You don't, you're already doing a transaction, which is very hard, especially, you know, if you're not, if you're more coming from corporate and not coming from a private equity lens, you're learning one new thing. You don't want to be learning an entire new industry at the same time. We're also trying to learn valuation, negotiation, networking capital, blah, blah, blah. Um, you want to understand, Hey, I have an edge. This is specifically what my edge is. And this is, and I'm ideally you also find a company that, Hey, it's struggling because it's missing this component that I can bring to the table. Yeah. Uh, it's fantastic party thoughts. Uh, really summarizes the whole conversation super well, Tristan, thank you so much for being here. This was a pleasure. Um, I'm sure our audience got a ton out of it. You answered every question before they even had a chance to ask it. So, um, I, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to have had you and, um, thank you again. Great. Thank you, Josh.